Right, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Nice to see you. I don't think there's any new people that I don't know this morning. Um, but lovely to see you this morning. Um, you will have noticed that there's a bit of a change in here, that we've got the pews in. Um, so appreciate your using these well with keeping in your bubbles and filling up from the end so that more people can get in if needed. Uh, and also, please do continue to pray for the refurbishment, for the rest of the money to come in, for it all to go well. Uh, and we're not quite sure how long we'll have the pews in here, um, so we can pray that they will be sold uh, and input into what we need for the refurbishment. Um, thank you for bearing with us as we have this strange middle stage. Today we're continuing on in our series on the last days. So as we begin, let's focus our minds with this truth that we've been saying for the last few weeks and which has been passed down through the centuries. Let's say together, Christ has died. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. And because Jesus is alive, we know that he's also at work in our lives by his Holy Spirit. And we have the opportunity every Sunday to share a bit of that through our God incidences. And it's a great way to encourage each other as a church family uh, in what God is doing, whether it's big or small. So is there anybody that would like to share something this morning? I know that, you know, sometimes when the leader shares, it's a bit sort of, you want people from the congregation to share, but I have been really encouraged by uh, the Lectio 365 app that I've been doing in my devotions in the last um, six months, and most weeks there are things that I really feel like God challenges me with or encourages me in prayer. Um, and also I've been really encouraged and challenged by this series that we've been doing uh, at church. And a phrase that jumped out at me last week from the sermon for anybody who was, well not from the sermon but from the Bible reading that the sermon was based on, was the phrase, do not be alarmed. And I suppose I hadn't really noticed that phrase in particular before, but you know, this series and this time can be quite alarming, I suppose. Um, but I just, it just really came out at me, do not be alarmed. And I was like, thanks, Lord. Okay, I won't be. So, um, yeah. Do, do share, even if it's little things like that, just to encourage each other. But for now, let's stand, and we'll call each other to worship using the words on the screen. So, as usual, I'll say the words in purple. If you could speak out the words in bold black font. <coughs> Here we are, Lord, your people, your church, meeting together. We meet as family in the presence of our Heavenly Father. We welcome each other, and we welcome you. As brothers and sisters in Christ, accepting the responsibility this places upon us to love one another as you have loved us. We meet as your lights in this dark world, and pray that through our words and our lives, others might be drawn into your family. Make, Make yourself known to us in new ways through our worship, our prayers, and our understanding of your word today. Amen. Okay, let's sing together.
thinking and praying about how to lead our prayers this morning, I remember this quote, I don't know if you guys know it, from Karl Barth, one of our most influential theologians of the 20th century. And he said, take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both, but interpret newspapers from your Bible. And I was thinking that the Bible and the news are key themes of this current series at St. John's, so I thought it would be good to pray into these and I would encourage you to pray out loud in your bubbles um, so that we can encourage and inspire each other in our prayers. And of course, if you're here alone or you're uncomfortable with this, then you can still pray quietly. So two slides are going to come up with our prayer pointers. You can just read them yourselves. I won't read them out. Um, one relating to the Bible and one to news. And we can follow those and then I'll sum up at the end. So first, let's pray around the Bible theme. Thank you. 
now let's pray with regard to the news. Dear Lord, we thank you for these amazing gifts that you have given us to help us understand your world, your word through the Bible and all of the resources and people that help us to get to know it and understand it better. (coughs) And the newspapers, channels and content that we have so much access to in this modern world. Please help us, like Karl Barth advised, to read both prayerfully and give us wisdom to interpret our news from the Bible and act and live accordingly. We ask all this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Okay, a few notices. Um, Just a reminder at the end of the service, if you're a parent, to collect your children promptly, even if you're staying around to chat. And also that prayer ministry is available by the kitchen. Our trained team will pray confidentially with you for anything. So do head that way if you'd like prayer. And if you're a parent and you would like prayer, And maybe you can ask a close friend to collect the kids and you could go for prayer. It's been great over the last few weeks to meet over Zoom with Prayer Club. Last week, two people actually joined us from their holidays, which was very impressive. That's the advantage of Zoom, isn't it? So please do join us if you can, even if you haven't done before this coming Tuesday. As mentioned already, phase two of our refurbishment is underway, which is great. Uh, And it does mean that we're going to be sharing this space for the next few months with our 1130 family and with the pews for now. So please do continue to pray for that and be welcoming and considerate of others at this time and patient and forgiving of any teething problems. And thank you for your support in that. And with regards to the pews, gone too far, if you know anyone who is able to buy any pews uh, or anywhere where we could, um, you know, advertise them and so on, then do let Barbara, Evelyn or Ross know. And lastly, our Diocesan Bible Week is coming up at the end of the summer, so do put that in your diary and come and join us for some great worship and teaching with the rest of our diocese community um, at the end of August, beginning of September there. Great, now we'll have our Bible reading from Revelation chapter 13. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. 
And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns on its horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dra dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast, and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. All the inhabitants of the world, world worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honour of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we need prayer after that passage, don't we? So let's pray for Ross and for each other as he comes to speak. Lord God, we do thank you for your word and you tell us that it's inspired by God and useful to us. So I pray now that as Ross comes to look at this passage uh, and other things around it, Lord, that you would really anoint him with your Holy Spirit and us also, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you want us to receive this morning and how you want us to live as a result. So we just give you this time, Lord, and we surrender to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Sonia, and hello, people. Good to see you. So as uh, Sonia's been saying, we are looking together what the Bible says about the return of Jesus Christ and what is often referred to as the last Days. So last week I talked about what I see as the coalescence of different prophetic signs all around us, which point to the fact that I think we are in the last of the last days. But I want to underline and ask us to remember that God has given us these signs, not for us to ignore, to think, you know, that's a wee bit tricky. I'll just put that to one side and forget about it. But he also doesn't want us to fear. Do not be dismayed. Do not be perturbed. But he's given them in order that we root ourselves in Jesus, particularly as we see these things increasing, and that we live out our lives faithfully in service to him, and that we ourselves are signs of the coming Christ, that Christ is in us, that we are people of peace, we are people of faith, not of fear, and that we view the world differently with hope 
because we know the one who is ultimately victorious. So that's the heart behind this series. Jesus said, remember, and we've underlined this a number of times, that we are to be like those wise bridesmaids. We're to be awake, we're to be uh, with our lamps full, in other words, full of God's Holy Spirit, spiritually primed for whatever comes down the pike, whether it's in 10 years, 20 years, or 50 years, 100 years, whatever. We're not talking dates. So last week we looked at more general signs, the general signs which Jesus himself gives us in Matthew 24. Those of you who were here will remember that. And this week we're going to look a wee bit more specifically um, at a few other key signs, uh, namely uh, things in and around Israel and things in and around this figure known as the Antichrist. So that's where we're heading today. Um, as I've tried to also underline each week, we need a good deal of humility as we approach this subject. We've got to look at these things, we've got to think about them, because Jesus says to, but we do so with humility because many good Christians have different perspectives than the ones that I'm sharing with yourselves. So let's read our Bibles, let's be prayerful, let's hold any position lightly while firmly uniting around the truth that Christ is coming again, okay? So that's all my provisos over. One key sign of the last days, which I want us to think about this morning, is what happens in and around Israel. In verses 29 to 31 of Luke 21, which is a parallel passage to that Matthew 24 passage which we read last week, Jesus tells his friend, what's on the screen there look at the fig tree and all the trees when they sprout leaves you can see for yourselves and you know that summer is near even so when you see these things happening you know that the kingdom of god is near and we've talked before haven't we how we can look uh, when we see outside a fruit tree is in blossom we know the season's changing. We know that fruit is on its way. Sonia every day goes out and looks at the blackberries. She sees a wee bit of blossom. And she's excited because she knows that we're going to have black, blackberry? blackberry and apple crumble soon, which will be great. So we know that change is afoot. And Jesus says similarly, as you see the signs that we've been talking about beginning to happen, then you know that change is afoot. You know that I'm on my way. So that's the plain meaning of the text but also typically in the bible israel is referred to as the fig tree and the other trees uh, frequently other countries other nations are referred to as other trees in scripture so whether jesus is making this illusion here or not that we should look at israel and look at other countries and what's happening as a sign most commentators because of many things as we'll see in a moment believe israel is a key sign to watch it's like the weather vane of the last days so let me show you what i mean after rebelling against the romans in ad 66 and then they did it again they rebelled again in ad 132 judea was crushed and you probably know if you know a wee bit of history that the jews were scattered they were scattered throughout the roman empire and beyond and what happened to the Jews was in line with a number of prophecies, particularly in Jeremiah, that God's people would be scattered throughout the earth, but also that they would be regathered again. And for centuries, no Jewish homeland existed. They were scattered, they stayed scattered, and people thought, well, that prophecy doesn't look as though it's going to happen at all. Despite losing their land, the Jewish diaspora, the guys who'd been scattered throughout the world, they held on to their language and they held on to their culture, which historically is unusual. When you lose your land, you usually your culture slips, especially if it's over centuries. But they held on to those things. And then in 1948, you know that something incredible happened. In 1948, after the Second World War, Israel were given back their land against all odds they were given back their land at least in part and they reformed as a nation and then again significantly in 1967 Israel took back Jerusalem 
So if 200 years ago we'd have been speaking and someone would have said, look, Israel is going to reform again, the people are going to have their land again, everybody would have thought, it's not going to happen, it's impossible. An independent Jewish homeland was like this dream of a, a wee bunch of Jewish zealots, but for most people they thought, that's not going to happen. But within our generations, it has happened. Now, we talked a fortnight ago about the final years of this age. Do you remember that last seven-year period, which the Bible has a lot to say about? Do you remember that timeline? And we looked at those last seven years. And one understanding is that that last seven years will kick off with the Antichrist, this figure, coming to power by strengthening a peace agreement. That's what it says in Daniel, strengthening a peace agreement. And with this in mind, it has been interesting over recent months to see momentum build behind these Abraham Accords. Have you been watching that playing out on your news, the Abraham Accords? Somebody nod and say they watch the news. Let me tell you what they are then. These are historic peace agreements, not so historic here at St. John's, but historic peace agreements between Israel and Arab countries that aren't bordering Israel. So, so far, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain have signed up to this Abrahamic Accord. But there's momentum for many other um, Islamic nations to be part of this accord. And Saudi Arabia, of all people, are talking about joining it as well. For a whole host of understandable reasons, Palestine is very against the Abraham Accords. But even Palestine because their funding from other Arab countries has dropped significantly over the last number of years. There's talk about even them coming to the table and talking about peace with Israel. So perhaps the scene is being set for that prophecy in Daniel 9, 27, that the Antichrist will bring about a covenant with many in the near future. Let's watch this space. So, that's a wee bit tenuous, that one. But more clearly in Scripture, you will also remember from a fortnight ago and the timeline that we looked at together, this timeline, that right in the middle of this last seven years, do you remember that the Antichrist is going to set up within the temple this thing that, that the Scripture talks about as the, the, the um, abomination which causes desolation? Do you remember that wee phrase? So he's going to set up something in the temple which is about worshipping himself. And that's repeated in two or three places in Scripture. So for that to happen, we said when we talked about this a fortnight ago, it requires for the temple to be rebuilt, doesn't it? In order for him to set up this abomination that causes desolation, it requires the temple to be rebuilt the rebuilding of the temple would be a major sign that we're in the last of the last days. Now Israel has owned the site uh, of the temple since 1967, but co-owned it, as I'm sure you're aware. The uh, Dome of the Rock site is hotly contested. Why? Because it's also a sacred site of Islam. It's also a sacred site for Muslims. So at face value again, just like what happened with the reforming of Israel as a state, you look at the situation and you think, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen that this temple, this third temple, if you like, is going to be rebuilt. And yet it might surprise you to learn that there is increasing momentum around the discussions of these Abrahamic Accords. There's increasing momentum for this third temple to be re-erected. In fact, everything is already in place for the construction. You can Google this yourself. The plans are in place. The architecture is agreed. Most of the furnishing has already been produced. The priestly garments have already been made. The Temple Institute in Israel is right now training Levites for service in this temple. And they're also seeking to breed a pure red heifer which in Jewish theology is needed as a sacrifice whenever they've built the temple to consecrate the temple and give it to the Lord. Breeding a red heifer that's pure enough is causing them problems, but if you read around this, you'll see that this is 
uh, happening. And what, what, what intrigued me is even the very secular Israeli government, who, if you know Israel, you know that there's a religious part and there's a very, very secular Zionist part. And the very secular Israeli government have put infrastructure in place in order to deal with the extra traffic that they're expecting at this third temple. So this isn't just somebody's pie in the sky idea, there is real momentum behind rebuilding it. All this to say, Israel is a key sign and keep your eyes on what happens there in the next few years. All right, let's move on to the rise of that figure known as the Antichrist and those infamous verses. I nearly left this out because they're so cliched and hackneyed, aren't they, these verses? Everybody in the world knows these verses, especially that last bit about the number being 666. So John sees the emergence in Revelation 13 of two beasts, two supernaturally empowered beasts. And uh, as you see on the screen, let me read the verses 16 onwards to you. The second beast forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of, the ma of a man. That number is 666. Now, you may remember from a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about different approaches to how we deal with last day stuff, that many of the biblical passages relating to the last days, we said, were apocalyptic in nature. Do you remember? And apocalyptic, the apocalyptic genre in the Bible is, is mysterious. It uses imagery and, and mystery and symbolism to communicate to us. So it's not easy to grapple with. And people debate what the symbolism in different apocalyptic passages means, or even how much of it should be interpreted as symbolic and how much of it should be interpreted as, as literal. In this passage, most understand that the beast talked about here is this antichrist figure referred to in other passages. Uh, today, I'm not going to talk about the mark of this beast directly. Although I think it won't be long until we'll have to discuss that in more depth. But instead, I want to focus our comments this morning on the sign related to buying and selling, the wee bit that I've underlined there in that passage. Because I think this is one of the key signs that we can overlook. So John tells us that... He tells us that the beast forces all people to receive a mark so that they could not buy or sell unless they had this mark. So what needs to happen in order for this beast, this antichrist figure, to stop people from buying or selling if they refuse the mark? Well, some sort of worldwide financial system with some sort of centralized control Otherwise, how can the beast centrally stop people all around the world buying or selling? There needs to be a global economic system in place, centrally controlled, that he can turn people off and on in terms of their access. Now, has there ever been a time in history where this could happen? No. Are we now living in a day where this could happen? Most certainly we are. If you read any sort of economic business journal or blog, you'll know that there's a global drive at the moment to make cash obsolete. There's a global drive to get away with cash and to move us into digital currency. And even just like the, the Times or the Guardian will talk about that. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily nefarious that we're moving towards a digital system. I bet you everyone in this room probably uses PayPal or, or Google Wallet or something. We all benefit from a digital currency system, don't we? Some of us benefit from using a digital currency system. But coincidentally or deliberately, depending on how you view the world, the real value of currencies like the dollar, like the euro, like sterling, like yen, all of them have been decimated 
in terms of their value over recent years, and especially over this last year and a half, decimated in their real value. That's why we're seeing talk of inflation and stuff like that around the world, because their real value has been decimated. And many economists see the writing on the wall for traditional currencies and expect that they will fail or be caused to fail in the near future and be replaced by a global digital currency of some description. Again, I want to underline technology is neutral. It's how we use that technology. But the point is that if and when this happens, for the first time in human history, there is the means for somebody to control what we buy or sell centrally. And so to enforce that mark of the beast in verse 17. An economy, indeed a society, which is predominantly digitally centralized, dramatically limits a person's ability to choose to live outside the system. Can you see that? If everything's centralized, if everything's digitally controlled, then it's very hard because cash probably won't exist or will exist in limited part. It'll be very hard to live outside of that system. Whether that system's good or bad, it's going to be hard for us to opt out. We'll be in or we'll not be able to play. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay. And if you think, well, what, whatever, that's all a wee bit sci-fi, I just want to encourage you to do a wee bit of research into what is happening today with social credit scores in China. Do you know about this? Just do a wee bit of research. Go home and do social credit scores in China. In the UK, if you want to borrow money, you need a good credit score, don't you? You need to be shown in your history that you've done things that show that you're a prudent person to lend money to, and then you're given money. Well, in China, they have a similar principle at work called social credit scores, but has much broader implications. So across China, individuals and corporations and um, state players as well are given a social credit score by the state which sort of scores their trustworthiness as decided by the state. So the state decides how trustworthy you are to them and then it gives you a particular score. So when you behave in a way which the state approves of, when you're a good Chinese citizen, according to the Communist Party in China, then your score goes up. If you do things which they see as unpatriotic or against the system, then your score goes down. So what? Well, a poor credit score, social credit score, is really serious. Because as you'll read, people are prevented from travelling outside certain districts if they've got a poor social credit score. Their employment prospects are severely limited. They're not allowed access to finance. They're not allowed the ability to enter into contracts, etc., etc. On the other hand, if you've got a very positive social credit score, according to the state, then it makes life much easier. So in this way, the Chinese government has a high degree of control over what its citizens do and can't do. Do you see the parallel? The point here is that as our personal data is increasingly collected, stored, monitored centrally, and as the economies of the world switch over, as they will shortly, to a digital form, I want us as Christians to take note of how this centralized system is used to control people, to control types of people from doing X, Y, and Z, and how this system could be taken by this antichrist figure to exercise global control for his ends. So for me, what's happening in that whole area is a very real sign of the last days. Now, listen, there are so many other signs that I could have gone into, and as I've been doing this uh, series, I've, every week I've thought, oh, what do I put in, what do I leave out? But, hey, um, we could have talked over the last fortnight about cosmic upheaval. That's a big one. Jesus talks about it in a number of, of, of occasions, that there will be signs in the sun, moon, and the stars, that there will be things that will happen in the skies above us that will think, what on earth is going on? Watch out for them. That there will be an increase in knowledge and travel predicted in Daniel 12. Well, we know that's happening. 
that these two witnesses of Revelation 11 are going to burst on the scene at some time and they'll help accomplish God's work by exercising incredible miraculous powers to accompany their message. That political alliances which are forming now are in, exactly in line with alliances which were prophesied 2,000, 3,000 years ago in Ezekiel 38, 39, three and a half thousand years ago. So look, I realize I've only given you a wee taster of, of the signs over these two weeks. And as I said before, if you'd like to talk through any of these things, please do. But my prayer in sharing these signs in this way is that we take the word of Jesus seriously. That we really look at what's happening in the world around us in the news from a biblical Christian perspective. Not so that we become fixated with the signs, you know, preoccupied with signs. No, so that we become even more preoccupied by the one who the signs point to, the coming Jesus. So that he becomes our preoccupation as we see an increase in the signs pointing to his return. Now next week we're going to we're going to finish this series by thinking about what happens when Jesus returns and then afterwards and we're going to think a wee bit about what happens when we die, what happens to us, what happens to your body, what happens to that other bit of us, soul, spirit. We're going to talk about that but I finish today with this. We're living in a sign I think where these prophetic signs of the Bible are increasingly coming to pass. Can I really urge you that when you see these things, look out for them and when you see these things, can I urge you to look up, uh, to fix your eyes on him, not on the circumstances around us, and to remember the truth that Christ has died, that Christ is risen, that he's living, and that Christ will come again. Let's be people who watch and pray, even as we get on with living fully for him now. All right, let's pray. Father God, again, there's a lot there to take in, Lord, and I pray that you would distill it in our hearts and that that message that we would be people who are watchful, that we are people who are faithful, that we are people who are hopeful, Lord, that those are the things that will stick. You have said that Jesus is coming and you have said that these signs point to the fact that Jesus is coming soon. Lord, sear that truth in us and help us to live accordingly, not in fear, but in faithful hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll continue in our worship as we sing together.
remain standing for our closing prayer. <coughs> Let's say together, Almighty God. Almighty God, who raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high, may we know your resurrection power in our daily lives and look with hope to that day when we shall see you face to face and share in your glory. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. So remember as we leave to be careful not to congregate at the exits and also there's an offering plate if you would like to give your offerings and if you're a parent to collect your child promptly and if you would like prayer to go for prayer. It's great to see you, enjoy your day, enjoy your week, hope to see you during the week. <laughs>